Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, guitarist, composer, and educator, Mark Bonilla. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, folks? Yep, it's that time. Another episode of The Rich Redmond Show coming to you from sunny Los Angeles. And today's a real treat because this show we talk to uh, actors, thought leaders, musicians, comedians, composers, anybody that's doing creative things and making an impact in the world. We talk a lot about music, motivation, and success. And I'm so excited today to introduce you. I've done this gentleman for a few years. We don't visit as much as we should. We really need to. But, I mean, this year has really been difficult with the zombie apocalypse. But he is definitely a world-class guitarist and composer our friend mark bonilla what's up buddy hey buddy it's good to see you man, yeah, man. after all this time you're right it's been like we've been in lockdown and it's it's been it's been tough man how yeah. you've been been holding up pretty well we're doing good man you know the folks that are doing the food delivery service they're they're crushing it <laughs> 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 i've been keeping them in business myself yeah right yeah. oh my but, god I yeah mean, did, you know I'm busy Totally, man. With that, tell us, you know, I mean, this is just a glaring, you know, I've got to ask, what the, what's the deal? What's the deal with all the helmets? Tell us about that. Well, I'll, I'll give you a tour here. This yeah, is, uh, yeah, this is, there, there they are. I just, nice. I just, I just completed this collection actually a few weeks ago. Uh, what that was, years ago, I was in, uh, when I was playing in a club down in San Jose, California, you know, having to commute like an hour, you know, you know, having to haul your own gear, all this stuff, you know, playing four sets a night. I had loaded my gear into this, into this club called Boswell's and I walked next door to kill some time before we went on. It was a sporting goods shop. So I went in there, I saw these full, these are like the full big, the, what they call the pro line helmets, NFL pro line helmets. They're the real helmets that the guys wear, you know? And I just went, you know, being an NFL fan at the time, I was like, man, check these out. You know, they were like all of the official helmets. They were all lined up around the perimeter of the store. And I said, I need to get, I need to get a collection of these. And I found out how much they were. It was like, oh, there's no way. Not on a musician's budget back in, you know, in the day. I wasn't going to do it. So I, I made a vow, Rich. I made a vow that I said, one of these days, I'm going to make it in the music business, and I'm going to have that collection. I'm going to buy each one of those helmets and have that collection. I just bought the last helmet like about three weeks ago Definitely, and yeah. got all of the accoutrements, mounted them all myself and all that. So it's been one of those things where it was just a, uh, it was a goal that I set back 37 years ago, actually. Nice. And, uh, yeah, and I finally just now completed it. You know, Th That's so incredible. It's, kind of, it's symbolic of your your commitment to what you do you know and, yeah, and man. You, know, you make a promise you keep it you know? yeah we have to and we have to love have the a, nfl you know, yeah man we have to have massive commitment to and be in this crazy business and to follow yes, through on do. things well, that's awesome it's like if you're a star wars fan it's like no this is the real theatrical yeah. stormtrooper helmet yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right this laser sword can actually cut your limb off you know yeah, that kind of, yeah. well yeah. that's a big i mean that is a spacious music room and you, you got a kit set up yeah uh, that, well, no, not in this room, but I can, I've had kits set up in here where, you yeah. know, we, we, we rehearsed here. Yeah, we can, it's, it's a big room. We can get a lot of stuff done. I have, uh, you know, I have Hammond, I have a whole keyboard section over here. That's where Keith Emerson used to hang out Wow. there, you know, and then of course I've got, uh, you can see mixing board and there's guitars everywhere, all in the corners and, you know, busy, and busy. I have a guitar room back here. Uh, there's a guitar room in there where you can see that window. It's, it's, there's a, you know, recording booth where I do a lot of, uh, voiceover work and then that's great and, you know, guitar stuff. So it's amazing yeah. to have a creative space like that, man. Well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, this is what you do when, you know, we, we moved here after I'd got, gotten my first, like a film to score, we got an advance and it was like my, my wife, Joey found this great place and, and, uh, so I spent all our money, put a down payment and building this studio because you have to, as you well know, and you've done this too, Rich, is, is you have to create a vacuum for what you do. In other words, you have to 
put it out in the universe that that you're you're worthy of the work or the experiences coming to you and you do that by prepping you don't do that by getting a side job at walmart you know you you do that by walking that tightrope and lighting that lighting it behind you so the only way you can go is straight ahead you don't yeah. look for exit signs you just walk straight ahead and you have to believe in it that strongly and create what I call a vacuum where you, the work will come to you. And it, it has, I've been, been very fortunate, but, but you have to enable it. You have to allow yourself to receive that stuff, you know, absolutely and, and to believe in yourself, you know? So that's what, that's what I've, I've tried to do. You know? I love that, man. So, so originally take us back. You're, you're, you're from the Bay area, right? Yeah. Yeah. From Walnut Creek, California, where I was born and raised. Yeah. Lovely. And then in the nineties, you make your way to LA because was your first kind of like compositional job. Was it with James Newton Howard? Is that right? Is the wiki, right? Yeah, it's, it's right. I, I originally came down here. Well, I'll back up a little bit. When I was playing in, in San Jose at one of these clubs that we were talking about, uh, I had, uh, been working with Ronnie Montrose and and Ronnie had financed my first solo album endeavor because he said, "Look, man, I got to get you out of these clubs, man. You don't you don't belong here, you know." And so he he was my mentor growing up in high school uh, because he produced my high school band Rock Island, and and uh, we got to be really good friends, and we helped each other on on projects. And so he bankrolled my first foray into instrumental guitar, and we were playing one of the songs with with the the band that I was in, JC and the Twisters. Um, down in, in San Jose, when in walks this guy from the pub, it looks like Keith Emerson, you know, and I looked at him and I'm like, God, that guy looks like Keith Emerson. Well, I dismissed it, played away, took a break. He comes up, but it is Keith Emerson, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of like in, in a little bit of denial, like, it can't be, what are you doing, you know, here? And he goes, hey, um, introduced himself, and he said, what was the last song you did? And I said, it was called White Noise. And he goes, uh, are you going to record that? And I said, yeah. And he goes, do you mind if I play piano on it? And I kind of, I kind of looked at him, and the only thing I could, say, the only thing I could say was, "Well, what have you done?" You know, as a joke, right? You know, just like, <laughs> you, have you had any studio experience? <laughs> right, right. And he starts to go, "Well, I was in a band called The Nice, and then I had a band called ELP." And I went, "Stop, stop, stop, stop! I know who you are. I have still have posters of you in my bedroom. Okay, so yes, I, yes, you can play piano on on this song. Yeah, and." So he took me and introduced me to, uh, he was doing a project in town with Kevin Gilbert, and I'd never met Kevin. Kevin and I struck up a real strong friendship. And long story short, he told me, look, you're doing this album. Uh, why don't I produce it with you? You come down here and live for the summer. You just live at the house, and we'll, we'll do this album. I've got, I've got Johnny Yuma, which was Pat Leonard's studio where Madonna used to record yeah. uh, in Burbank. We can do basic tracks there, and then we can do the rest of it at my house. You know? And that's what we did. And at the end of that time, he was in a band called Toy Matinee with Pat Leonard, and he said, look, we need to tour this stuff. Uh, why don't you come to Japan with me? And I said, absolutely. So that was the start of Toy Matinee. Toy Matinee uh, were favorites of the Mark and Brian show, which was like the top morning show in, in L.A. at KLOS. And so they, we ha they had us on a lot. And uh, in, in the course of one of the performances, James Newton Howard had heard uh, me playing something, you know, and he knew our manager, Doug Buttleman. And so he called Doug and says, hey, who's the guitar player in your band? You know, I said, well, that's Mark Benin. He goes, do you think he might be interested in doing some soundtrack work? So, of course, Doug asked me that. And I said, yeah, I would yeah. love to do that. So, I jumped in. I met James uh, and and uh, did work on uh, Digstown and American Heart were the first two um, movies that I did. Music then Falling Down. Waterworld, wow. my God. Uh, then we got into like, you know, later years, Born Identity, Green Lantern, uh, Space Jam. God, there were a Is lot the, of them. The Replacements, um, Scorpion King. Yeah, yeah. and things. then he asked me to start doing stuff, you know, like, can you do a tune for this or that? And then he would, you know, he was a lot more comfortable at that point knowing that I could give him back what he wanted. Yeah. He also had a buddy of his, Marty Dabich, who was working on, he just started, uh, he was working on General Hospital. And I was work, I was doing a lot of work for him and working with Ricky Martin, writing songs when Ricky was on General Hospital. So wow. I, I had gotten my chops that way. And then Marty did 90210. So I did all the guitars for Beverly Hills 90210, the original series. See, I got to go back and, 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 and re-listen to a lot of this stuff. That's Mark. Yeah, I, mean, I love that I movie falling right down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, well, and it was, that's, a, that was a funny ass thing. And here's where I learned about the unions is 
I did this one thing where they wanted an effect, right? And I, I, I had, so I hit the guitar, went bam, just this one thing, right? They ended up using it throughout the, the like that was the, that was the, the moment that 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 um, Michael Douglas broke. That was like the theme. So they used that effect like thirty times. So I get this huge check in the mail each time they used it. They had to book a, a double scale double session for that. Oh my! You know, like God. I got like this chunk of money. It was like, what the hell was this for? So it was the running joke. It was the 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 bang that 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 you know made me thousands of bucks That's great. on this one thing. You know, but it was like, wow, the union. This is this is a trip. You know how how this works down here. You know, uh, so anyway. Yeah, so I started doing that, and then I got involved with, you know, Paramount and doing a lot of shows for 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 Paramount. And I did a show. I actually got nominated for an Emmy Award for one of the uh, the themes that I did uh, with my wife Joey. Uh, she sang it, and I played it, and did the, the all the the soundtrack to the PJs. You know, uh, to Larry Wilmore's uh, talk show. You know, the nightly show. I did the theme for that. So this. A lot of lot of things that, that came of that. It was great. It was great, great. I got to meet so many great players. You know, all the session yeah. players in L.A. came through. And so, you know, I was either on their sessions doing stuff or I was, they were working with me on stuff that I would do. So it became a real great family kind of organization, you know. So it That's was, amazing. It was, so you just, I mean, I just feel like I, you met some incredible people early on that saw something in you. I mean, we were in high school when you were working with Ronnie Montrose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, you know, the first thing was when Montrose broke up, and when was it? I mean, when the when Sammy left Montrose, rather in '74, I think it was. I found out through some circuitous route his phone number. You know, I was always good at at lying and bullshitting. You know, to to get find people's numbers, right? And I would masquerade as somebody else. I did that with Rick Derringer. I did that with with Sammy, where I called him. And I knew he was looking for a guitar player. And I said, hey, Sammy, I'm your new guitar player. And he goes, who is this? You know, I said, hey, he's Mark Benia. I've never heard of you. Yeah, well, you will. You know, I had all this, you know, Ooh. cockiness. And he goes, and he goes, I like your energy, kid. Why don't you come over? And he, yeah, I went over. It was he, I think he lived on Monford Street in Mill Valley at the time. I went over there and, and Bobby, or was it Billy or Bobby? His, uh, uh, Denny Carmasi's brother. I think it was Billy, uh, was playing drums, and then it was Sammy and I. And so we, we went through some tunes, some Montrose tunes, and I was ripping it up. And, you know, and I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, after his was over, so I said, so what do you think? You know, and he goes, well, you're fast. I'll give you that. You know, that was his comment. So I went, excellent. Hagar thinks I'm fast. I'm like all of 23, you know, at the <laughs> time or 21, whatever I was, you know. But I didn't get the gig, you know, and I was like, what, what happened? You know, and it didn't dawn on me till later that, you know, they want, they wanted somebody that could, could be tasteful too, duh, you know, but at the time, you know, it was, you were trying to put your best foot for whatever it was anyway. But Ronnie had, um, our manager at the time, uh, was part of the Bill Graham organization. And then Bill Graham managed Ronnie Montrose and, and Ronnie was looking to, uh, to produce somebody. And so Ken Greenberg had said, hey, look, I've got a band, Rock Island. Uh, why don't you come in and meet them? And so he did. And I immediately lacked, was, plus the fact that I was a huge Montrose fan. Sure. I, uh, I sure. locked with him and we, be, you know, he ended up living not too far away, became friends with my folks, come over all the time. And, and uh, we'd work on projects together uh, separately. I would do stuff for him. He would do stuff for me. So it became a really good strong friendship you know that that lasted all the way up until he passed you know yeah so, man. But yeah I, I did get lucky knowing some people early i on. love that denny carmasi man he was influential oh. big time do you keep in touch with him uh i haven't talked to him a while, while but we did a we did a great show when ronnie passed we did a montrose tribute show right. up in in san francisco and it was you know so i was i was we i was part of the gamma uh band and it was glenn letch and it was you know uh davy pattison and then denny on on drums and then i played guitar you know and it was it was great because i was such a fan of denny's growing up you know you know i just he, he was such a and plus they had remember that curl flame bl uh, flame set that he had it was black with with this sunburst curl flame it was the coolest kit i'd ever seen on stage till to this day that's my favorite kit wow. and um so it was great playing with him and playing with all those guys. You can see it on, on YouTube. It's, it's on there. Had such a great time, you know, and then, you know, I'm paying tribute to my mentor, you know, and so, uh, but I haven't, I haven't stayed in contact with him. He's, I know he's up in, I think he's up in um, Oregon. Oregon, like Portland, classic car. Yeah. Oh, 
Wow. Yeah. He works I, on cars a lot. Yeah. That's what he does. You know, he got, he got on my radar sure when he did. was doing all the heart stuff and he was just so cool. And he had oh, like yeah. black symbols yeah. and black hardware and black drums and black heads. And he wore black and he had pitch black. Everything was black. I was like, oh, I can get, I can get on with this. And then I saw him like at like a, it was like a foreigner, like 30th anniversary tour or something. And they came through Nashville yep. and um, that's when Lou Graham was still kind of doing it. Oh, yeah. Great stuff. What a voice, man. Huh? So you also yeah, worked on yeah. Justified, right? Was that one of your recent gigs? Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. Justified, tell us about the was, deadlines um, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Cause I hear that that stuff is, well, is it, like, it's intense. Yeah. So it's the, like, well, Steve Percaro actually got the, the gig and uh, he called me <laughs> kind of in a state of panic. Cause he goes, dude, what are you doing for the next, like, you know, uh, several weeks? And I said, nothing, but I think I can get out of it, you know? And, and, and he said, I just got, you know, contracted to do this new series by, you know, Graham Yost is the, the, the exec, the showrunner called Justified. And they all, it's all guitars and banjos and mandolins. I'm a keyboard player. I can't play that shit. <sighs> um, can you bail? Can you help with this? And so I said, absolutely. You know, and so we got into it and I had to buy a banjo. I bought a, I bought a, uh, uh, you know, a, a national steel, you know, and trying to find, you have to find left-handed versions of these things. <laughs> and um, so I ended up, we ended up co-writing the first show together nice. and they loved it, you know? Nice. And, and so we ended up as the series went on, went on for five, six of uh, several seasons. That's great. Um, we ended up kind of splitting the responsibilities. He would write and I would write, and then we would combine stuff and I would play on the stuff that he wrote. And, and uh, Graham Yost, who is the, sh uh, the exec and creator of the show mm -hmm. was a huge prog fan. Yeah, major. And so he knew me from Keith Emerson and was like real stoked that I was doing the show and provided the much needed barrier between the executives who oftentimes would have conflicting notes on your music. Uh, as far as we need more of that, we need less of that. He would, he would just say, don't worry about that. Your reviews are great. You do what you do. I will deal with these guys. And so it was one, it was like heaven working with Graham. Um, and, there, you have to obviously each 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 week you had a new um, you know you had to write you know you had a, all this music that had to be written yeah. and we never repeated anything for a long long time because you know you have to develop a library for your stuff and you have to develop a palette but you find that when in writing or actually in any creating that the stuff doesn't it doesn't come from you it never does it, it a lot of people think it does and when they do what you create for yourself is a finite source of, of inspiration. It's like going out in the desert with a canteen of water. You got some at first, but after a while, <laughs> it's going to run dry. Then what are you going to do, right? And this sure. is why people get writer's block, because they think it comes from them. I got nothing left. No, you never had anything. What you have is a flow that goes through you. It's, it's much, instead of a canteen, you have a, a river that flows alongside that desert. And anytime you need to, to dip from it, you go over there and you dip your cup and you drink. And this is why people that create stuff will go back and, and listen to stuff and they'll go, you know what? I don't ever remember writing this. I don't know how the hell I came up with that riff or that drum thing or whatever yeah. it was because you didn't. Whatever, whoever was channeling through you is, is, is what is that? That's, it's like firemen that are up in, the, up in the loft and they're up there reading, you know, and they're up there watching TV until the alarm goes off. <laughs> That's the alarm, or this is the alarm, or this is the alarm. And they all yeah. come sliding down the pole going, where's the fire? Yeah. It's up to you as a musician and as a writer to keep your truck tuned up so that wherever they need to go, they can respond. You know, it'll respond. And so that's, that's the thing about writing is we had a blank canvas every week. You know, I didn't know what I was going to write, but I had no issues with it, knowing by the end of the week, I would have a full show written because... Yeah. The flow always comes. I've never had writer's block because I know that it's not from me. It's it's through me. And I would sit, I would sit on the on the couch, be watching like a Raider game with my with my guitar, with my digital recorder, and I'd just be plunking away, and all of a sudden like some riff would come up and I go, ah, you know, and I'd pause and I'd I'd put the riff down, and that's it. And I, I it, it's a form of meditation where and I'm sure you've had this happen to you where you come up with these great ideas for your drum stuff or whatever it is. Most of the time, it's not when you're on the kit. It's when you're running, when you're exercising, when you're driving, when you're jogging. You know, you're doing stuff where your mind is idle. And this is what it takes. It takes 
you you have to have a settled mind for that to come in. It has to be distracted. That's when you remember names of things you can't remember. It's not when you're trying to remember it. Right. It's later on when you're not putting an emphasis behind it, right? And because your brain needs these it needs headroom, so to speak. That's, and that's, so that's, that's what you do. Yeah. You, you know, and, and so you have to keep in a relaxed state in order to do that. You can't be distracted. You have to be relaxed. And, and once you get to that point, then the creativity will just, it's, it's, it's perpetual. You'll never run out of ideas. You, right. I, I firmly believe that you will never run out of ideas. You know? So the producers, I mean, that's an amazing concept. And I know that you do some, you teach, a, uh, you know, guitar, songwriting, orchestration. So these are like heavy concepts. These are like big picture concepts that a lot of people uh, need to know. So when you're composing for a TV or a film, uh, I'm sure the directors or the producers or showrunners are sending you the footage, right? And you're writing to the image, yep. right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the deadlines. Tell us about the deadlines. It's like they might well, say we need like this by. The deadlines are. Yeah, you need it by the end of the week. And a lot of times, you got to remember that for music, you know, music is a third of what what you see on uh, you know on the overall thing. You have the, the you have the dialogue and the acting. Right. You have the photography and the lighting, and then you have the music. Those are the three main things. Of course, the effects you know, obviously play into that as well. And with mu- with the score writers, we're always in, I don't want to say competition with the Foley guys, you know, with the car chases and all of that stuff, but it does figure into the thing. And so sure. you have to, I immediately, whenever I go into a project, I make friends with the, with the music editor, you know, and with the guys that are doing the effects because we're always competing for the same sonic space. And I want to make sure that they know that I'm a team member here. I'm not here to make this a musical moment if it doesn't need to be one. You know, let's 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 be respective of each other's spaces, you know, because it, it, it does come to that, uh, depending on what narrative you want to put across. So when you when you come up against a, a deadline like this, you have to look at the footage think because music is a narrative it's a character in your film it's an it's just like an actor and the the thing is you're get you're the last person to get this stuff before it goes to air right everybody's put their sound effects in everybody's looped their dialogue everybody's done all those things all of the the crap that's happened that has slowed production down and put it behind you're the last guy with the baton and you got to run your ass off a lot of the time to catch up because other people have stumbled or fallen or ran slow because the deadline is the deadline you can't you can't say sorry i got this late yeah well too bad you know you signed on for this so we always we're always the ones that have to make up the time right you know running around the track and so you have that extra pressure but again you look at what the scene needs and you decide whether or not, you know, and a lot of times the director will sit with you, you know, or the production, there'll be production notes so called spotting notes where you'll have, okay. you know, we, we want the you know music to start here, there, not, not always often do they have what kind of a thing you want, you know, in other words, what kind of a sentiment you want. You want to play to the action. You want to play against the action. Do you want to be neutral? You have to, as a, as a, as a composer, understand what, part of the story needs to be forwarded at this point. What's the focus of this scene? You have to really be cognizant of the, of the writing um, and to know what it is in the character development that needs to happen. Are you playing the, the, the action straight on? Are you playing something that universally is happening but isn't being emphasized with the dialogue or the photography at the moment, you know, so that you tell, a, you're telling the story along with everybody else. You may be telling it on a different dimension, but you're telling that narrative and that's what it takes. It's not an easy thing to, no. and it's, it takes years of development and, and listening to other great scores, you know, like James Newton Howard, like Ennio Morricone, like Bernard Herman, these guys that are masters at what they do to, to, to study it and go, what, what, what am I feeling here? And where is the, what's the music doing and what's the dialogue doing? How am I, you know, how is that all collectively working? And you start to get a viewpoint for how to write scores. It's, 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 it's quite a bit. I mean, it's easy to write a car chase when it's just spot on, dun, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. But when it, it's the subtler scenes that require you to feel the music, but not be noticed, not notice the music to the point where you're distracted away from the dialogue. You know, but if so you take you that really music away, have, the emotional weight might not be as heavy. It's heavy. diminished. Yes, right. Yeah, exactly. So these are the things that you have to weigh 
you know, as, as an audience, uh, you're an actor. You really are another actor in the film that's, that's doing something invisible, so to speak, visually, but emotionally, no. You know, and so, you know, as, as I'm sure you can, you can tell that there's, you can, you can have one scene and put different types of music and you're going to get a completely different feel depending on what type of music you put in there. So you really are, have a hold of the emotional reins a lot of the times. And some of the times you want to create what, what I call a, mo, a, a musical tofu, where you're absorbing the, 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 the sentiment of what's happening, but you're not, you're not uh, manipulating it. Good example is is Thomas Newman's score for like uh, uh, the Green Mile, uh, the scene with, uh, where Brooks is is in the hotel, uh, um, James Whitmore, and he's going to hang himself. And there was a beautiful uh, piece, piano piece that he became very much sought after for that type of stuff. Called Brooks was here, beautiful piano stuff. He did the same type of stuff in American uh, American. Um, oh, what's it? American Beauty. Oh yeah, yeah. And. Some beautiful oh, yeah. piano stuff that was completely neutral, but not neutral in its emotional impact because it really did something for that scene that it let the scene breathe, but it, it just put this, this, this beautiful gloss over the top of it. It was amazing. And he's often been asked to recreate that type of sentiment because it worked so well for that type of stuff. So again, it's, it's a different art form, but, but your deadlines, getting back to that, you, you, you really do have to just concentrate and, and, and know that the flow is going to be there. And, and it will. I've never been, I've never handed a project in late. You know, I always knew that by the end of the week, I would have something. But you have to be in a relaxed state to receive that, just like you have to be in a relaxed state to drum, right? You can't be tight. You have to be loose in order yeah. to, you know, in order to flex all yeah. of that stuff, right? You don't, you know, you can, you can look like you're you know, doing that because you are, but you're still inside you have to be relaxed. And that's really where it comes down. It comes that, down that in any art, doesn't matter. Dance, martial arts, a film, any of that, sports, you have to be relaxed. The Rich Redmond Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. So and so, well, you've yep. done a, a lot of instrumental music, whether it be your solo records or the scoring. So and then, but you've written songs, and you know all about that. Does that when you hit that and you're like writing for lyrics in a three minute, three and a half minute structure? Is that like a piece of cake? Like after after like having to compose for a giant TV series? I don't know that it's a piece of cake. It's a different. It's a different animal. You Which know, one do you, you prefer? You have different yeah. parameters. Yeah, I don't prefer it, it, it. I don't have any preferences on this because I I learn something from every experience. Nice. You know, uh, Troy Laquette and I had a band uh, for a while called Seville Row, and I wrote with Micah Griner. Wrote this great stuff. You you know because we played at one of your. That's how I met you. Yeah, in Nashville, like uh, around 2013. Yeah, right. That's how we met. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, it was one of those things where we just flowed. Again, it was a flowing thing where Micah sat in here with me. We just started. I just I hit the tape button, and he was singing like just phonetics. 
you know, uh, on the lyrics. And we were coming up with things about, ah, there's, that's cool. You know, again, it's, it's, it, it, it comes back, it comes down to being in a state of mind, like you're, you're an actor and it depends on what film you're in will depend on what role you play. Right. They're all going to be, you know, to some lesser degree or greater degree, maybe one of your favorite songs or whatever, but you have to put yourself in the role of that actor because what, what, what music is ultimately it always been is, is storytelling. You have to tell a story. It doesn't matter if it's lyrics or a melody. It's all narrative. And these are the things. It all comes down to, to telling a story and making the story work. You know, once upon a time, ending with happily ever after, but a great arc somewhere in, you know, in it where you're introducing characters, which could be instruments, uh, introducing uh, you know, plots that go on for a little bit, Re repeat callbacks, all the things that you do in a script, you do in music. It's the same, same laws apply. Sure. You just have to know how, be aware of those things and develop them either lyrically or melodically. And it doesn't matter what form you're in. I did, you know, I was asked when, when Keith Emerson and I did, were asked to do this um, a project called the Three Fates Project. Yeah. We, it was a, uh, I was asked to, do, uh, to compose for the Munich Radio Orchestra, you know, so I had a full orchestra and I was asked to compose something like, my God, yeah, you know. And so I did a couple of pieces, a couple of, you know, uh, or reorchestrated American Matador and then wrote a couple of new pieces. And then we orchestrated some of, of, of Keith's uh, classic stuff and he wrote some stuff as well. But I remember being over there, one of the pieces I wrote called The Morning Sun, uh, Torsten Schreier, who was the producer, I guess he's a very, very prominent classical producer in Europe. Right. We were upstairs editing him. And he goes, so where did you study? And I went, huh? <laughs> he goes, what conservatory did you study at? And I said, the street, <laughs> mainly, <laughs> you know? And he goes, no, wait a minute. No, no, you, where did you study formally? I said, I didn't study anywhere formally. He says, well, you must have studied Mahler. And I went, I, actually, I don't listen to Mahler. I listen to W.C. Ravel. And he goes, and he start. you can see the veins start to pop up in his neck. He goes, well, this piece sounds like, like Mahler would have written it. And I went, well, okay, I'll take that as a compliment. And he goes, you're telling me that you didn't study anywhere. You just wrote this stuff? And I went, mm, yeah, pretty much. How long did it take? Like a week to write the it, – it, it aggravated him to no end because it blew his paradigm completely out of there. Like this is rock hippie – you know, musician coming in, how dare he write something like this that reminds me of a Mahler piece and didn't go to a conservatory, didn't do this stuff. The, the reason I'm saying this is because it's channeling. Again, it's whoever wrote that. I don't take credit for that stuff. I, I don't. I, it's, I'm glad that they chose me as a vehicle. And, and I'll, I'll be gracious when people say that was a brilliant piece or whatever it is. But it's not me. It, it would never was me. It was somebody else coming through. And, and so it doesn't matter if it's a three-minute pop song or it's, you know, a classical piece, or it's jazz improv or whatever it is, it's still somebody up there doing it, whatever you want to call it, universal consciousness, muses, God, uh, you know, the ghost of Jimi Hendrix. I have no idea, but it's <laughs> something going on through it because I have no control over it. I just do it. And later on, I'll go, wow, that was great. I wonder who did that, you know? Uh, and that's, that's really how it is. It, it's, it's, it's almost like you're, you're, you're miming and someone else is doing your dialogue for you, but you get into that zone and you just channel, you know, so it doesn't matter. So all my stuff is my favorite stuff for different reasons for that, because it was a learning experience. It was further proof that this does work, that, that how I feel about this stuff really does time after time validate itself and its authenticity. So it seems to tap into your, like your, some, your spirituality or your, it does. Your, of course yeah. it does. Yeah. Yeah, man. Don't you feel that way when you of, drum? Of course. I feel like I feel like if you're doing it right and you've put in the time to prepare for that moment, in the moment you can let go and then something enters you and people are like, "Why do you make such weird faces, dude?" I'm like, "Hey, I'm not trying to be Jerry Lewis. I'm just losing myself." And if I'm concentrating about not making these faces or looking academic when I play, I'm not going to be able to submit myself to the moment. You know, well just said. surrendering. Well said. Yeah. That's exactly it. Just said the word. Surrendering, surrendering to the moment, it, man. That's, that's it. 
Yeah, yeah because that you, you then at that point you're not responsible for anything. You just are what you are, you know. And and you're you and that's the thing is, it's a difference between playing something and performing something. It's a whole different cake, you know. And that's the thing is when you have the energy coming through you, that's a performance. Sure. You know, because it's it's sure. more than just you doing it. It's you plus whoever is really propagating this whole thing. And then, of course, that the audience hears that, they witness that, and they know truth when they hear it. They know pretentiousness when they see it. And when it's a completely non-pretentious event, they're swept up into it because they can see, oh, man, he's, he's in the zone, man. That's, that's it. And, and, and it's very infectious. And, and you, you, you take everybody with you. You, you give them this great magic carpet ride, and you set them back down again and go, wasn't that a fun ride? <laughs> great hay ride. You know. So, so your long-standing relationship with Keith Emerson, you have, you have this latest project, which is an all-star tribute, which was, was that recorded in 2016? Or was it going back already that many years? Yeah, five years ago. Five wow. Years. Well, the reason that it took this long to get going or to be released was when Keith passed, you know, it was very traumatic for me. I lost a musical partner, you know, and, and, a, yeah. and, a, and a real true friend and, and, uh, so the family had asked me to organize a, a tribute concert using Keith's constituents in L.A., uh, you know, and, and his friends and, and the guys he worked with. And so and I knew all of them, basically, because we, you know, we all work together. It's a great musical community here. And so they all, without it, with, to a man and woman, said, absolutely, what do you need? And I had them pick the tunes that were important to them, you know, from Keith, that, that, nice. that fashioned them or changed their lives. and. And it was amazing that everybody picked something different. So we, we kind of had our set list picked for us that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, everybody volunteered their services. You know, Dan Gross volunteered his camera crew to shoot it, uh, which I wasn't expecting. Uh, Dirk Schubert came in, brought all of his gear. Uh, it was just an amazing amount of, of philanthropy that, that happened, that people were paying back what Keith had given them because Keith was a stargate between classical music and rock. He held that porthole open and made classical music cool for rock players and made rock music acceptable for classical players. And so it, he was a, the first person to really hold that open and show what you could do by combining those two worlds. And so, so many people owed their direction change to that. And so everybody was kind of like they were auditioning for Keith, you know, when they were playing that night. They brought their A game. It was an amazing show, one that you'll never see again with that caliber of musicianship where every one of those persons on that stage could helm their own band. Yet they all left yeah. their egos, if they had any, outside yeah. and said they were all servants of the music. And that's what we all are. We're all servants of the music. There's no one person that's greater than what you're playing. If you think that at any one given point, then you need to, to rethink yourself and yeah. your role in music because it's a big ass mountain that none of us will ever be bigger than. And I hope we never get to the top of it, but everyone was a servant. And, uh, you know, Luke came in, uh, Luke at there and said, Hey, I know I'm not a keyboard player. Whatever you need me to play, I'm there for you. You know, same thing with Skunk Baxter, you know, and you, you know, we had great, great drummers, Bissonette, you know, uh, Vinnie, Vinnie. Caliuta, Troy, Laqueta, Troy, Joy Trevors, all, all these guys, just amazing players that were playing the song you know they weren't like overplaying they were just they were doing what needed to be done you know i can't wait and to see it so I because of that, to see it. it's amazing it's amazing um i sent you a link by the way i'll make sure that you get it because yeah, i'll put it in the show notes where, where can people find it where can people find it just grab it well you can find it at cherry yeah cherry uk is where you can get that the, the digital download uh, high hd quality blu-ray quality will also be available there so you can go there to to find that and the thing was that all of the all of the um uh, money is going to the Focal Dystonia Research Foundation, the Keith Emerson Fund because Keith suffered from Focal Dystonia which is mm -hmm. where it was an involuntary uh, collapsing of these two fingers when he was playing it's a it's a brain nervous disorder uh, that a lot of musicians get, but don't know that they have it. And it's a career, a career ending malady uh -huh. and they need to have more research done on this. And so all the money, and that was the thing that, that everybody knew that at the beginning, this was all done for charity. I wasn't, you know, the money we were going to make was going right to charity. It took this long to find a record company that wouldn't want to take a big ass cut of that. Mm -hmm. And so cherry red, um, uh, 
was able to, uh, and KUDG, uh, KEDG management also uh, helped that. Martin Darbell helped foster that. He kind of put, called in a personal favor as well, but, but Cherry Red decided they were going to give the entire thing to the Focal Dystonia Charity Fund, which, which is why it took five years, because I wasn't going to, I was going to make good on my promise to, to my, my people that this was done for the right reasons. If I have to sit on this forever, it'll be so, but no one will make money off this other than the charity. And so that's fine. I'm, I'm just very thankful that, that, that they came through and that everybody came through with it. It is an amazing night. I mean, the, it, when you see that many great players firing, all the cylinders were firing on, on 10, all in the same direction. And the emotional impact that, that we had, not only for Keith, but for each other. We were all fans of each other, you know. And when you, when you have that many players playing on the stage that are admirers of each other's abilities, you can't help but get swept up by it. And that crowd was amazing. They were so appreciative. It really was a, a, a combine of, of, of sameness, you know. And it was, it, it, you, you don't get that as often as you'd like. You know, you get you get bits and pieces and glimpses of it, but that night, it it was a special night, and it, it just it made you proud to be a player, and it made you proud to have known Keith, and to see how much that he he joined everybody. You know, he he really did, and and so many relationships were born from that night. You know, it's 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 it, I always liken Keith to an oak tree, that's that's fallen, and what happens to an oak when it falls? It shakes all these acorns loose. And each acorn plants a forest, and each one of those is a relationship. And wow. so all these great forests have grown from, from his influence. And so that's what we were giving thanks to that night. It was just a tip of the hat and thank you for changing our lives. And this is a little bit of, just a little bit of payback for all that you did. Well, good for you, man. That is, congratulations. That's, I know those kind of things are a massive it's a massive thing to, to put those kind of events together. Well, it was, but you know, it had, it had a divine direction to it. And I'll tell you why, why I believe that. Beside all of the wonderful things that happened was that week I got incredibly sick from all of the, the, you know, the, the, the stress of, of putting all that together. And it wasn't the musicians that were generating the stress. It was just logistics, you know, renting the place, insurance, catering, you know, press, publicity, all these things that I, that, you know, I had to do. And because I didn't really have that many people to delegate it to other than Mari Kawaguchi, who did a, a, a big piece of it. But my voice, I lost my voice that week. I had no voice. I was, it was basically a whisper, right? And we had one rehearsal for this. We had a rehearsal and just one, one rehearsal. And I couldn't sing. You know, I had Rick Livingston and, and Tra Travis Davis come in to, to help with the singing for rehearsal. But, but again, you know, I, knowing that I had to do this the next night. And up until 30 minutes before I went on that stage, I had no voice. It was gone. No it pitch, came back just no nothing, in time. No tone. No I, I went into the, into, into the bathroom backstage, and I, I kind of sat and tried to find something in there that I could generate tone and try to feel what that was like. All my Ron Anderson lessons said, you know, I was bringing full force to, to bear. And, and, and I threw up a, a prayer to Keith. I said, Keith, man, this is, this is your night please help me through this, you know, and you'll see at the, at the, at the end of um, Carnival nine, which was the first tune we did, I have to hold this a flat for a long time. And you see me kind of go up like this and, and talk is because I'm throwing up another prayer to Keith. Like, here we go. All right. You with me on this? And then I had to hold, and I was like, I'm holding it. I'm, I, I have it, you know, and, and it, I literally went from, from lyric to lyric that entire night, all the way to the end where I had to hold a note higher than that. And I, I, Rich, to this day, I don't know how I did it, yeah. uh, other than the fact that there was had to have yeah. been divine intervention because I had nothing prior to that, you know. And it was like I'm not that good of a singer that I can pull that off, you know. But something happened uh, where it happened, yeah. and so uh, you know, yeah. it was just one of those things where things were meant to be sometimes, you know, and, and, and I thought this, now I've really reached the wall, but somehow I got over it. So, you know, with, with obviously somebody else's help. Yeah. So. 
Well, great. Understood. I mean, I, I, I can't wait to watch this thing. I'm so, that's so excited. Congratulations. And um, yeah, the funds generated are going to go to a great, great thing. And I know in recent years, you've kind of pivoted a little and you have this exciting new thing because I'm listening to the sound of your voice and it sounds like it's could be on a Ford commercial. Or <laughs> it a, is on a Ford commercial. Oh, exactly. Do, Tell us about that. Well, I, my wife, uh, I get, I get, I do interviews. Goes, oh, you got a radio voice. Oh, you should be doing voiceover stuff. Uh, so my wife Joey had suggested this uh, a while ago. Says you should really be doing this, and she would send. She sent me this website called Voice One Two Three, and it was it's a great way station uh, for you. You pay a fee, and then you know they send you auditions. And so I, I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll I'll give this a shot. And I ended up being the voice of Kubota for like three years, uh, which was like the, the competitors to John Deere. And then I got signed on to do like Ford and Chevy commercials and all of that. I did like the voiceover for Ram Rambo's last movie, the trailer for that, uh, Ford versus Ferrari. You know, it, nice. it just started like snowballing, you know. And uh, so it's great. Yeah, so I have kind of a secondary career in, in, in voiceover stuff. Uh, which has been great. You know, it's, it's good supplemental income, you know, for, for when you have COVID, um, <laughs> when you can't tour, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, it, you have to pursue your, you know, uh, I really have come to, to, to discover that you have talents always in more than one area and you have to, you have to, you have to develop those talents. And, and what I, I, I told a lot of my, my friends and constituents over this last past year is look, I know that you know, you can't tour, you can't do any of that stuff, but you need to take this time and pretend you're like an outlaw up in the, up in the rocks, right? You got your, your band of outlaws up there and you're waiting for the posse to arrive. So what do you do? You, you clean your gun out, you clean your gun, you polish your bullets, right? You practice your aim, you feed your horse, you know, you, you practice riding, you do all that th stuff you need to do. So when the posse shows up, you can come out blazing. You know, I mean, you can come out firing a better individual than when you went into this. Yeah. And so that means learn Pro Tools, learn how to shoot video, learn how to edit, learn how to do all those things that you say you don't have enough time to do what you'd like to do, but you can't do it because you're touring. Take the time to better yourself and to make this negative into a positive. It's really important to make sure that you still progress, stay visible, you know, do all of those things that you need to do while you're in this you know, this circle, you know, yeah. do everything that you need to do so that you come out empowered. And that's, that's kind of what I did. And I did a lot of voiceover work, you know, with that. I learned a lot of other things too. I, I got a third degree in black belt, what? you know, along with my wife, we're both third degree black belts now. So it's, it's one of the things we wanted, you know, that we wanted to pursue. We'd been taking for a lot of years, but it's, you know, it gets more strenuous as you go up the that, chart. That's incredible. The yeah. So it, it was a lot of, a lot of uh, work and a lot of stress, but you have to stay motivated. You know, there's other things that you can do. You know, while you have this on hold, spend time with your family, you know, with your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it happens to be, get, you know, make, you know, use your energy. Energy is never destroyed or created. It's just diverted into something else. We learned this in biology, right? Yeah. So put the energy into something else for a while, recharge that, then the energy will move to this. It'll eventually come back around to you and it'll come back around to touring. And when it does, you're going to be a better musician, better artist than you were when you when you uh, when we first entered this a year ago, you know, or how long, however long it takes. Absolutely, yeah. man. You have such a positive attitude. I love it. It's so it's so contagious, and you know, enthusi your enthusiasm is contagious. And um, you know, I try to you know sometimes I feel like I'm crazy doing as many things as I do, but then I talk to someone like you, and this is very uh, affirming. It's very. You've always been. You've always you've always been that way. You've always been able to manage a lot of different things. I've always admired you for that. You you can manage a lot of things because your energy level. Level permits that not everybody's energy level or confidence level allows you to do those things because you need to kind of go out of your comfort zone sure, to see sure. what you're capable of you know staying in your yard doesn't you know you'll know your yard real well but you won't know like what's across the street oh man check that out over there you know there's a great burger joint over there I never knew that was there look at that pizza joint down the street New York pizza I can get a Detroit special I never knew that Hello. you know Hello. it's it's those types of things that you need to explore you need to get out of the water like David Bowie says you got to get out in the water far enough where your your feet don't quite touch the sand you know, where you, you still may have a little control, but you're in uncharted territory. It's, it's why we're here in the first place. We're not here to go in circles. We're here to go in a straight line. 
you know, yeah, we need to push the boundaries and take yes. chances and invest in ourselves and show up and all the stuff they say. It's so true. And you're just kind of a, a living, breathing example of that. I mean, I mean, you know, you have this God given ability, but you recognize that and you took that raw ability and you cultivated it and you put in the tens of thousands of hours. And then you combine that with the fact that you're just such a nice, likable guy. And, uh, you know, I just think it's a great thing. And I, man, I hope we can get to play together at some point. We are. Uh, you know that's going to happen. Yeah, man. You know Mark Bonilla music. Bonilla. <laughs> I got to get the right. It's it's a it's a Spanish Italian thing. Um, do you do a little cooking? Uh, a little bit. Yes, I can cook chilaquiles. I can cook a, a few things like that. Yeah, I, I love I, you know, chilaquiles. My wife is a much better cook than I am, but I I have been. That's one of the things I've been doing. As a matter of fact, during lockdown, we have chickens now. See, there's another thing we did. We were what? raising chickens now, Maybe. and so we get fresh eggs, and so I'm in there. You know, let's let's see what I can do with these besides throw them on Halloween. You know, and uh, you know, it's so it's it's uh, yeah. You you just you know, it's all connected. You know, the thing is, you know, art. My, my son said something interesting the other day because Nate is a is an artist and he listens to music constantly. And he said, "Dad, what's what's what is music? You know, I mean, what what is it about music that makes music music?" And I never really had to think about that for a minute. But he he, he said, "Music is what." is the, let's see, how did he say this? Music is what creates visuals and visuals are the information that generates music. And what he meant, I think, is the fact that all of this stuff is connected. You know, whether it's cooking, whether it's martial arts, whether it's sports, whether it's dance, painting, you know, film, Creativity. poetry, writing, it all is subject to the same exact principles. They're all the same, you know, which is relaxing, channeling, uh, you know, uh, discovering, pressing, like all the things you were talking about. All of those things, are, it's, it's all related. It really is. And it, the more you do, the more you see how it is related. And that's the thing. Um, you know, if you only have a limited source, only a few little points on the coordinate uh, grid, you're only going to get that far. But once you start seeing all these other dots, then you start connecting them. And all of a sudden, there's a picture there, one you wouldn't normally see if you hadn't had enough dots to connect those things. And so yeah. that's why doing things, pushing yourself to seeing what you're capable of, you'd be, you'd be surprised, you know. I've, I've been scared a lot, but being scared is good. It's that adrenaline, you know, be going like, hell, can I write for a symphony? I don't know. I'm going to find out. Yeah. You know, you, but just, you, just, you say yes and just go, what the hell did I do later? That's, you know, that's, that's fine. You can do that. Say, but, say yes and, and push through the fear because a yes. lot of things you want in life are on the other side of that fear. I got to tell you, Mark, we, this, is, this is, is, is deep, and I think we could do like two, three hours easy. Yeah. I, I booked these a little too tight today for my taste, um, uh, but I just wanted to say that you have um, an amazing guitar book as well. If people want to reach out to you, how do you like yeah. to be found? Uh, markbeniamusic.com is the best way. Yeah, you can reach me there if you, yeah, I, I've got a new book called Balance of Power that talks about a lot of the things we talked about. Today. The only guitar book you'll ever need. It's true. That's you can true. do the voiceover for it. your own uh, product there. <laughs> yes, that's right. Or I can get you to do it. You know, that way, you know, I get another voice on there. But man, yeah, I, yeah. So, I love it, man. I, I, it's so many, so many amazing offerings, such a deep history. Um, you know, you're changing the world one chord at a time, man. And I, I really appreciate you sharing your, your, your gifts and your talents with uh, this audience today. Well, thank you for being such a gracious host. And it's always good seeing you, Rich. You know, and it's and great we to see play you together. It, that, 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 that we will definitely film. Absolutely, man. I love that. Well, thank you so much, man. And hey, to all of our listeners out there, we have a rich, we have an email address for you. It's the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And as always, this is my, this is my ask. Can you subscribe, share, rate, and review? We sure appreciate it. There's about a million podcasts out there and that just helps people find the show. So keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here. Mark, thanks so much, man. Oh, my pleasure. We'll Let's meet talk again. soon. Everyone okay. stay safe out there. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe. Rate and follow along at richredmond.com.